In this video, we're going to have a look at the theme of innocence in chapter one and chapter two of Lord of the Flies. In watching this video, I'm hoping that it will give you some idea about how you can go about exploring the themes in this novel um, independently. One of the best things you can do when exploring a theme in a novel is to look for quotes that link into that theme. This quote from chapter one, to me, sums up the complexity of the theme of innocence in this particular novel. In chapter one, Golding writes, the fair boy, that's Ralph, said this solemnly, but then the delight of a realised ambition overcame him. In the middle of the scar, he stood on his head and grinned at the reversed fat boy. Now that quote, you could just read through that and pass it off as well. Ralph standing on his head and so on but when you look closely there at what's actually happening it gives us a fantastic piece of information to feed into any essay that we do on the theme of innocence in this novel. So let's have a look at why I think that quote is so important for the theme of innocence. First of all Ralph stands on his head in the middle of the scar. Now the scar this picture here is actually the scar left on the earth after a tornado. But if you imagine the scar left by an aeroplane that's flown into the land of the island, it wouldn't look um, too dissimilar from this. So you've got a scar in the ground caused by the crashing of a plane, a plane that was taking boys from a war zone to safety. You've got that scar smashed into the island and in the middle of that scar, a small boy, aged about 12, is standing on his head. To me, that is the ultimate symbol, the ultimate irony in this novel of the, that conflict between innocence and destruction. Because a boy is standing on his head in the middle of a scar caused by the crashing of a plane. So here's how I might write about that, that particular quote. Ralph, standing on his head in the middle of the scar, is a brilliant symbol of the innocence of the children. Here we have a scar smashed into the virgin land of a previously untouched island by a plane escaping war, and in the middle of this shocking stain of destruction, we have a child performing the most ridiculous and unnecessary but typically childish and fun-loving, action of standing on his head. This expression of joy in the middle of such an obvious place of destruction that will no doubt have claimed the lives of many is symbolic of the capacity of children to be oblivious to danger and destruction. It is symbolic of the innocence of the boys at this stage in the novel. It's worth looking up your own definitions of some of these key words. So the word symbolic, the word oblivious, um, and the word innocence. Just make sure that you understand what we mean by these words. There's a similar moment in chapter one that I'd like you to have a go at writing about yourself. This is the moment when the boys, Jack, Ralph and Simon, have gone to explore to see whether or not it is indeed an island that they've landed on. And when they climb the mountain, halfway up they come across this rock that's balanced precariously on the edge. It's just leaning and all it needs is a push. And the three boys take that time, they take that moment to push the rock off the side of the mountain for no reason other than because it's fun. And there's this quote um, that Golding tells us that this boulder smashed a deep hole in the forest canopy. What I would like you to do is write down a short answer similar to the one I wrote about Ralph standing in the scar. Write an answer to the question, how is the toppling of the rock, how is this pushing of the rock off the mountain 
symbolic of the innocence of the boys at this stage. Why does this action, why does them pushing the rock off the mountain show their innocence? I would write approximately half a page on this one. So think carefully. Why would this show, indicate the boy's innocence? The next thing I want you to think about from chapter one is comparing the boys to see their levels of innocence relative to each other. The boys are all very different from one another. And in this particular extract, you've got three separate quotes from three of the boys. I want you to identify firstly, who says what? So who's responsible for which of these lines? Then I'd like you to suggest what each of these sentences says. What does it imply about the boy who says it? So the first one, for example, um, a boy that you're going to tell me the name of, a boy says, look, candle buds. And when he says that, he's referring to these tropical flowers that look a little bit like candles in the bushes. So who says, look, candle buds? And what does that imply about that boy? What sort of boy says, look, candle buds? The second quote is a different boy, and he says, you couldn't light them. What does that imply about that particular boy? Who says you couldn't light them? And what does that suggest about him? What sort of person would say that? The third quote is from another boy, and he says, we can't eat them. Who says about the flowers. We can't eat them. And what does that imply about his character? So, write down who said each quote. Write down what each quote implies about the boy who said it. And then the last bit asks you to rank each boy in terms of their innocence at this point. Of those boys, who is the most innocent of the three? Who is the least innocent of the three? At the end of chapter one, we have a very interesting moment when the pig appears, the piglet, and the boys have the task before them of trying to kill it, trying to catch it. It's Jack who has the knife, and that in itself is worth worth thinking about. Why do you think Jack is the character who happens to have a knife on the island? Golding tells us, there came a pause, a hiatus, The pig continued to scream and the creepers to jerk and the blade continued to flash at the end of a bony arm. The pause was only long enough for them to understand what an enormity the downward stroke would be. Then the piglet tore loose from the creepers and scurried into the undergrowth. Your question to answer here is how does Golding present Jack in this moment? Try and use the word innocence in your answer. You might wish to think about the previous slide and look at how Jack's innocence or not is changing from moment to moment in this chapter. So how does Golding present Jack in this moment when he can't quite bring himself to kill the piglet? Chapter two begins with a really interesting description of the boys being called to the meeting. Golding says, by the time Ralph finished blowing the conch, the platform was crowded. There were differences between this meeting and the one held in the morning. The afternoon sun slanted in from the other side of the platform and most of the children, feeling too late, the smart of sunburn, had put their clothes on. So this... I think we've probably all been there at the end of a hot day when it gets towards tea time and you're sort of starting to feel a little bit warm. You're starting to feel tired. Um, The excitement of the day has um, died away to a certain degree. 
Um, this particular image to me is a great definition um, of innocence. It's a great description of what happens to children after a lot of excitement, after a lot of activity. What you can do now, I've given you a few examples in the previous slides. As part of your revision, find your own moments from chapter one in which innocence is either demonstrated or in which in innocence comes under attack. So look for moments where people show innocence or where they seem to be attacking someone else's innocence. Make notes for yourself and add them to your overall revision notes. And these are the sorts of things that you'll be discussing with your teachers in your meets. During the assembly, the meeting in chapter two, the boys start to talk about the fact that they're going to need some sort of rules in order to keep everybody safe on the island. And Ralph says, and another thing, we can't have everybody talking at once. We'll have to have hands up like at school. He held the conch before his face and glanced round the mouth. So this is interesting. The boys... Their only experiences in life so far have been in their family homes and in school. And so what they're doing is they're drawing upon their experiences of how things work and how to keep things in order. They will act as if they're in a classroom. They will have hands up, or as it turns out, they'll pass the conch around if they want to speak. And they will share the conch to make sure that everybody gets a say. Here is where you might start branching out into your notes on civilization, because here is where the innocence of the boys and their lack of life experiences leads them down towards the path of creating a certain type of civilization that reflects or mirrors what they've seen in their lives at home. Here's your next question to link into the theme of innocence. After this little discussion about hands up, Golding tells us Jack was on his feet. We'll have rules, he cried excitedly. Lots of rules. Then, when anyone breaks them. My question is, why does Jack want rules? And as a secondary question, you need to think about what this suggests about Jack's innocence. What sort of experiences might Jack be calling on at this point that's made him go down this road? Let's have rules. Lots of rules when anyone breaks them. Let's bring Piggy into the mix. So, so far, Piggy has been, as we said in previous PowerPoints, Piggy has been the parent, he's been the adult, he's been the one who seems to be looking at this situation in the most realistic way. So in that sense, he so far is perhaps the least innocent of these boys. He's seeing this situation for what it is. In chapter two, Piggy makes a statement in the meeting he stands up, he demands the conch, and he says, Nobody knows where we are, said Piggy. He was paler than before and breathless. Perhaps they knew where we was going to and perhaps not, but they don't know where we are because we never got there. He gaped at them for a moment and then swayed and sat down. So this is Piggy breaking into this little classroom setup that Ralph's got going on. He's stepping inside everybody else's thoughts about how exciting this island is and he's just dropping this little minor issue that nobody knows they're there. Nobody knows they're on the island because they never got to where they were supposed to be getting to. Nobody knows where the plane came down. Now that in itself is an important decision from Piggy. Not many people would stand up and say that to a meeting of everybody. Not many people would want to, and not many would even think it. Now, the response from the other boys is emphasised by the difference between this black and white 
image that Piggy gives them and then this image that Ralph fills the boys' heads with after Piggy's spoken. Ralph says, but this is a good island. We, Jack, Simon and me, we climb the mountain. It's wizard. There's food and drink and rocks, blue flowers. Piggy, partly recovered, pointed to the conch in Ralph's hands and Jack and Simon fell silent. Ralph went on. While we're waiting, we can have a good time on this island. So, this is a fascinating moment. Ralph, on the surface, is kind of pushing Piggy back a little bit. And he's saying, all right, yeah, no one knows where we are, but, 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 this is a good island. There's food, there's drink. The other boys chip in with, there's rocks, there's blue flowers. Um, And Ralph says to the boys, we can have a good time on this island. Now, first of all, that could imply, couldn't it, that Ralph is a bit naive and that Ralph is not as bright as Piggy. He can't see what's really going on as much as Piggy. But I want you to think about why else would Ralph be telling all of the boys, it's fine, this is a good island. While we're waiting, we can have a good time. Why would Ralph say that as leader? And that's really important because Ralph's decision to say these words tells us a lot about what's happening to his own innocence. What is Ralph becoming at this point? So why does Ralph tell the boys this? And what does it suggest about Ralph's character at this point? The next moment you could pick out in chapter two about innocence is a crucial moment in which we find out that the little ones have started to have nightmares. He must have had a nightmare, stumbling about among all those creepers. More grave nodding. They knew about nightmares. He says he saw the beastie, the snake thing, and will it come back tonight? So this is the moment where Johnny, the little boy, has stepped forward to talk and Piggy is communicating for him because Johnny doesn't feel he can speak in front of the others. But Johnny says he saw a beastie, a snake thing, and he's worried it's going to come back that night. This is a classic example of the innocence and the youth of these boys. Remember, the little ones, some of them would be no more than six or seven years old. Now here's where we start to see Jack establishing himself as a leader. And we start to see links between this paranoia of the beastie and the nightmares and the Cold War. Jack seized the conch. Ralph's right, of course, there isn't a snake thing. But if there was a snake, we'd hunt it and kill it. We're going to hunt pigs to get meat for everybody and we'll look for the snake too. But there isn't a snake. We'll make sure when we go hunting. Ralph was annoyed and for the moment defeated. He felt himself facing something ungraspable. Now this moment is key. How does Jack put himself forward as a leader here? What does he promise to the little ones and how is that powerful? The next link to innocence in chapter two is when the suggestion is made to have a fire. The discussion about having a fire deteriorates very swiftly into absolute chaos and excitement Because, as you'll probably know, if someone suggests making a fire or making a den, that's it, everybody's off. So that's exactly what happens. A fire, make a fire. At once, half the boys were on their feet. Jack clamoured among them, the conch forgotten. Come on, follow me. So here we have a situation where young boys are being young boys. There's the mention of a fire. They're in a large crowd. Next minute, everybody's running chaos ensues. This is innocence in action and naivety in action. There's no planning, there's no forethought, there's no care, there's just excitement and there's fire. So again, this is where innocence becomes naivety. Life became a race with the fire and the boys scattered through the upper forest. To keep a clean flag of flame flying on the mountain was the immediate end and no one 
looked further. So, the excitement, the chaos, the boys running, the piling on on the fire, results in approximately a quarter of the island being burnt to the ground. The issue with this, apart from the huge destruction caused, is the fact that the boys don't know how many little ones were still down in the forest eating fruit. And it's Piggy who points out that the boy who spoke earlier with the mulberry birthmark on his face is no longer anywhere to be seen. <laughs>